Okay, so um, I'm Gavin Nyman. I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I probably met most of you last year then. So, and um, basically, I've been asked to talk on sports injuries. So I hope that's a topic anyway. That's what I had in my head. So, as I wrote this lecture very quickly last night and today. So, as you had a fair bit of it prepared already. Now, um, thanks very much for coming along. And I'm going to record it as well. Um, so hopefully, if it works out okay, I can put it up on on the YouTube channel. So if anyone wants to listen back to it again or other people who haven't been able to get here they can at least see it as well see how the how the video works out what's the name of the youtube channel um our youtube channel is the musculoskeletal teaching channel actually um I'll, I'll bring it up at the end is that we, all the videos that are hosted from the musculoskeletal the actual university i think only gave us about five gigs of data on the actual canvas site so to you know a couple of videos fills up five gigs so We've actually, to actually get the, all the videos for the teaching we did last year for fourth year and everything, all those videos are hosted on a YouTube channel and it actually links through. So you can always go to that YouTube channel to watch the videos that we've done in the past. So to be honest, I actually don't know the address for it. So I'll have to call it up at the end of the, of the talk and then show it to you. So um, I think we'll probably do it at the end, shall we? So I also, I don't know if you remember, but I've been promoting it for the last couple of years. I've got that podcast series going as well. So. I think the next week or so we should reach 50,000 downloads. So we did the, yeah, thank you. <laughs> and uh, so I'm quite proud of that. So it's actually, well, the most recent one's the acute abdomen we did with Adrian Anthony. He does a really good talk on that. So that might come in handy for you for next year and everything. So, um, but on, going back to sports injuries, we'll start off. Really, um, my background, of obviously in orthopaedics, you think you'd be really good at sports injuries, but until you actually start working in a sports club, actually you don't realise how much it involves. So I was actually involved in a club over in the United Kingdom when I was over there, but also at Glenelg, uh, the Tigers, um, South Australian National Football League team, for about five or six, maybe a bit longer years. And uh, there I worked with um, Mark Cezanne, who's actually helped me out with a bit of the talk here. He's actually the club doctor for the Crows. So he went, he from, went from Glenelg and is actually the main doctor for the Crows and helped us out with a bit of it. Because really, um, let's make sure we get this working. There we go. Maybe not. Why is it not working? Next slide. After all that. I have to start again. See how the uh, play from the start. There we are. So really there's a lot more injuries that occur than other than this orthopaedic injuries. And of course the big one in the media at the moment is concussion. So um, this thing is on, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, good. Uh, concussion. So that's the major one. And that's really, you think, well, how's an orthopaedic surgeon going to look after that? And it is. When you go to a, look after a footy team, not just being doing orthopaedics, you actually have to know a few other things. Like a couple at the bottom there, I saw so many conjunctival bleeds uh, from direct trauma to the eyes. And also, one particular one, I'm glad actually Mark was on this particular day, the guy, he actually knew the, the kid was just getting over glandular fever. When he actually was tackled or um, thrown to the ground, he actually ruptured his spleen. So when he came off the field, he was looking very pale. Mark got an ambulance organised for him and clinically thought he'd ruptured the spleen. And that's what it was. It was actually a splenic bleed from a, a tackle at footy. So, and that was associated with Epstein-Barr virus. So there's a few other things that actually are more than just orthopaedics that actually need to know. So if you go and work involved in a footy club um, or any of the sports teams, it's actually really good fun. It's actually a little bit tricky because you sort of get to know them quite closely and get the players really well. It's almost like treating a family and it gets a little bit hard trying to you know, uh, keep the, a distance from the players but also be part of the team as well. Um, but it's actually really exciting things. And I learnt, I learnt a lot of it from my... Um, experience with Glenelg actually taught me a lot you know, about the team approach to treating things and it's actually what life and medical medicine is about you know you don't want to it doesn't always have to be you looking after the patients you helping other people look after a patient a team approach to treating a, a patient or a team approach to treating or teaching students and that's what I've, I've learned as a as you get a good life skills from it so I would recommend it down the track if you get a chance to be involved in a footy club or a netball team or a, whatever club you're involved in um, is actually quite good fun. But when you get trauma, you've got to go back to the first principles. And the MST or ATLS, the Advanced Trauma Life Support System, still, still survive, is important. So if someone's had a major injury, you can't just focus on what's the obvious, but also go back to the standard ABC or doctor's ABC to remember the assessment. Okay, and uh, that's, you've seen the high-profile high, high profile, um, 
uh, players recently in both, uh, I think, the English Premier League or certainly rugby have had major injuries and, uh, and had to go back to looking after the neck or checking out their heart as well. Concussion is a big one in the media at the moment, and so it should be. It's a major issue. Um, there is actually, and I've got it in my bag there somewhere, but the, <coughs> the SCAT-5 is the current system. When a patient gets a concussed on the field, you need to be aware of the guidelines for it. And there's actually an international con uh, conferences that are held regularly, and the most recent one's just been last year, where they discuss how to assess a patient with a concussion scenario. Obviously, anyone that's concussed needs to be removed from the field straight away, and they shouldn't return to playing until they're well over the concussion. And the guidelines will set beside number of days they should hold off. The AFL, I think, at the moment, it's 12 days of not playing for it. But certainly, if they've still got some continuing symptoms, then they shouldn't be returning. Um, obviously, when you see a concussion, you've got to go back to the standard principles of assessing the neck and the airways, first of all, airway breathing, um, circulation and the neck. Um, but then you get them off the field. Um, assess them for the proper SCAT system, and there's a reference here for the SCAT. If you have a look at that, that's actually the proper SCAT system, which stands for the um, Sports Concussion Assessment Tool. It's actually, a, I don't know if you can see it on the, you know, it's obviously FIFA, it's got the Olympics, all the, all the major uh, sporting um, groups have actually put, contributed to this assessment tool to assess how will they recover from it. Um, but certainly, uh, as you would expect, if I, if I kept breaking my wrist after a fall, you're going to end up having problems with your wrist long term. Well, people keep having concussions or drain trauma. There is a risk of it. And that's a, it's a, at the moment, it's still an evolving area. But the problem is, is that prolonged concussions can be medical issues. It can lead, lead to neuropsychological issues, balance issues, uh, um, our ocular um, visions. And also, we don't know the long-term risks, whether it actually leads to mental health issues and also degeneration. And it's all in the media at the moment, and this will be something that you guys might help solve over the next uh, decade or so. Getting back onto the more orthopedic things, the things I'm more at home with, then the most common, we're going to start from the top down. And shoulder, shoulder dislocation is one of the most common sporting injuries you might see. Uh, obviously, the classic is a fall and outstretched wrist. Australian rules football, but on a lot of sports too, but I'll go back to AFL because it's my home, home territory. But AFL is designed really to dislocate your shoulder. You go for an overhead mark, you've got your arm up in this position, the abducted external rotated position. You go for a tackle, okay, they fall and they fall with their arm outstretched. Same in rugby, all the, all the sports. So it's designed to actually dislocate your shoulder. The most common dislocation is anteriorly. And obviously, initially, you've got to reduce the shoulder. There's various different methods of assessment of reduction, and you've got to be what you're, what you're happy with. The standard, probably the best technique, is the, is the Hippocratic technique, which is where you actually put direct inline traction with the shoulder. But I've seen all various methods. The Cocker one, which has a risk of breaking the shoulder, so you've got to be careful doing it, it's where you externally rotate it and then internally rotate it to get it back into joint. Or there's also ones where you just hang the patient down over, this, over, the, um, over the brush or the, over the table and let the arm hang and let it pop back into joint. Um, all m numerous different methods of reduction and there'll be things you'll, you'll come across that definitely when you're in casualty in your internship years. You've got to be aware though that posterior dislocations occur. They're more common in, if it's someone who's had a seizure um, and it's, this is a tennis racket sign where you get the ball, it looks like a tennis racket, it's like a symmetrical uh, sphere. And you say, well, look, maybe that's in the joint, but actually it's a sign of posterior dislocation. So to be aware of that as well. Because that's actually one of the ones that can be missed. In the olden days, the treatment for it would be a, a repair, and you do it, go in and tighten the capsule with an open approach. But nowadays, we tend to repair it. Now, I'll just step into that. The, the actual principle, ever, I think everyone knows, that, and we'll go on to about cruciate uh, ruptures later on, but everyone knows that a cruciate rupture, nearly everyone has a stabilisation. I'll go through the reasons for that. For a shoulder dislocation, it's a very similar scenario. Now, for those who have been in theatre with me and actually watched my arthroscopies, you'll see that when you actually look from the posterior portal into the shoulder joint, the actual socket, you actually realise, you're taught this, but you don't actually notice it until you do an arthroscopy. The socket is one quarter the size of the ball. So you can imagine the socket and the big ball sitting on. It's like asking you to run across a sports oval carrying a large soccer ball on your hand. It's quite hard to balance it. Now, the labrum's job is to actually increase the size of the socket, but it only is a bit of uh, uh, tissue around the outside of the socket to help stabilise it. And when the person has a first-time dislocation, then that labrum and the capsule peels away from the edge of the socket and makes it more unstable. An example I'd like to use, it's like having a breaking a soup bowl. 
if you have your soup bowl and you, 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 and you break this side of it and the lip breaks off, if you try and put it back together but leave a gap and then put a ball in it, the ball wants to fall forward into that gap. Well, if you, if you glue it back together but you put the, the lip back further, what we call medialized, or put it further down the, down the position, the ball will want to tend to fall out the side. Well, the same thing when you have a label tear or a capsule tear, what happens is it either doesn't heal to the edge of the glenoid or it heals in the wrong position, more medialized, so it doesn't act as a small, like a buffer to stop the ball falling out of the so shoulder. And you'll see that on this video here, if we play it. You'll see, this is me starting to repair a shoulder. This is actually years ago I did this, so it's, it's, the quality of the video is not quite as good. But this is the edge of the glenoid, and I'll just try and get my pointer. That, that's a glenoid. We've got a pa <coughs> patient orientated as so they're lying down. Here's the capsule, and we're putting in an anchor on the edge of the glenoid because this capsule and the labrum has peeled away as the patients dislocate their shoulders. It's an acute dislocation. It's actually, I think, one of the glenoid players, actually. So, And uh, we put in a socket, <coughs> sorry, an anchor, with the sutures attached to it. And these aren't really that big in real life. They're, they're the size of a pencil. And those sutures are used to pass through the labrum, which you can see it's not attached to the edge of the glenoid now. <coughs> Sorry. So what we do is we mobilize the labrum and use a, a passer to pass those sutures through the labrum. Now, there's two different ways. This is one where we actually tie knots. There's also a knotless system we can use as well, which I've probably moved to recently. But um, either way, you actually want to grab that tissue and retrieve it and tie the sutures down to the, the, the edge of the glenoid. So we'll pull this back through. Hopefully, those videos always seem slow when you watch them back. Well, they probably look slow when you're watching us, when you're seeing this edge of the theatre watching us. And you can see we're tying the capsule down using a knot. This is like a little noose that comes down and retrieves it and ties it, tightens that up the edge. Now, if it's a chronic dislocation, we have to roughen up the bone beforehand, but in an acute dislocation, it's already roughened and bleeding because it's all, it was all quite bloody, which is why there's so much blood in the joint as we do it. We pass them down and we cut the knots. And we tend to do a few of those, so you'll see a couple of them come in. The idea is to restore the labrum and the, and the, the capsule back to the edge of the glenoid to support the shoulder. In fact, you can see, you get an idea of how big the ball is compared to the size of the socket on this view. Even though this is looking from the back, when you look from the front, you even notice it even more so. <coughs> so more knots going in. The idea to repair all the tissue around the end is the socket. <coughs> A few minutes to go. And you can see, as we come up the top of the shoulder, there's the ball. We're looking initially down the bottom, the bottom corner, what we call the six o'clock position. And we slowly repair all the tissue back to the edge of the socket. And that, but just up here, you're just getting a glimpse of it. It says white tissue, that's the long-headed biceps attaching to the labrum. That just there. It's just getting a glimpse of it just there. So this is how, if you have a, if, so if any of you suddenly dislocate your shoulder tomorrow and you've never had a dislocation, the actual figures are there's an 85% chance of a re-dislocation in your age group, particularly if you play contact sports. Now there is a scoring system you can use. It's a funny name, um, it's probably an easy one to remember. It's called the ISIS score. Um, that was actually around for years, be well before other, other groups in the media. Um, but, um, well they may be around before, I don't know. But um, the, um, and it's actually designed for injury, injury severity score to decide whether someone needs to have a stabilization. If I dislocate my shoulder because I'm an old, old bugger and uh, I'm not doing as much sport, the chance of a dislocation for me, re-dislocation for me is 15%. In fact, a greater risk for me is actually tearing my rotator cuff as I dislocate it because of my age and the, and the cuff being de getting more degenerate as I get older. But for you guys, if you dislocate your shoulder, you've got 85% of re-dislocation. And so there's an indication to go in and, and acutely stabilise the, uh, the capsule and the labrum. Now, not everyone gets that straight off. A lot of people treat it conservatively. And of course, one in six people probably won't need it. But if they have a second dislocation, then there's basically a 100% chance of a re-dislocation. So ideally, in an ideal world, with un unlimited resources, we would repair everyone, just like we do for a lot of cruciates, um, for an acute dislocation. Now, 
This is for an anatomical repair, but the people who dislocate in the first place are more likely to have lax ligaments in the first place. So when I was involved in Glenelg, we had to do a screen one year and we actually looked at all the players coming through. And after about the first 15 or 20, you could actually predict what injuries they were going to have. You know, if they had had previous patella dislocation or cruciate, they almost always had a shoulder injury coming up or had had a shoulder injury because they, people who got lax ligaments are likely to dislocate other joints. Well, the ones who didn't dislocate were more likely to get stiff backs or, or what they call osteitis pubis, which I haven't covered in this lecture, which is where you get pain at the, at the pubic symphysis. And um, those people end up with more other issues. So, in other words, people who dislocate shoulders or dislocate a ruptured cruciates are more likely to do it because of lax ligaments in the first place. And that it's also more common in ladies because, first of all, their ligaments aren't quite as big and also because of, of the hormones in their body as well. So, so it's actually will probably be an issue for the... AFLW, although it's still good to watch. Um, not the dislocations of the sport. Um, the, uh, I don't like watching the dislocations at all. <laughs> I sort of cringe every time I see one. Um, the, um, if you have a, and this is a terrible typing by myself last night, um, if you have a recurrent um, dislocations and they've got lax ligaments, then you can actually do an anatomical, you can go away from an anatomical repair, which is what this is, and do a salvage type procedure where we actually take part of the coracoid and put it on the front of the glenoid to stop the shoulder popping out the front. And here you can see a bit of bone block from it with some screws holding in position. And that's called a latter J. And that's based, well it's been around for years, but it became more popular probably, I don't know, 10 or 12 years ago, when a high profile AFL player who had had a arthroscopic repair like this went on to re-dislocate. And then, he, then one of the surgeons did this for him and he got back to sport very quickly. And so a lot of the AFL players now have these done as well. It's a bigger operation, it's done through an open approach, but it's done for someone who's at higher risk of re-dislocation, particularly if they've got particularly lax ligaments or they're playing high level sports. But you can see it's actually a, a bigger procedure than just repairing the labour and back to where it came from. We'll move on. Now everyone, when, all of you, when you come through, wants to know about slap injuries. I don't know where, you might see it in the curriculum and everyone sem somehow seems to focus on it a lot. And uh, every time someone mentions to me, I, quin I cringe because it's actually a, um, it's, it's a big thing that was made a big thing of about 20 years ago when shoulder pain wasn't settling. A lot of people found that tears of the, the labrum, where the biceps attaches to it, could cause pain. Uh, and uh, for a while there, we were going on to repair these. This is called sl slap lesions or superior labral anterior, so from anterior to posterior avulsions. Um, and really it's an extension of, when you have a shoulder dislocation, you tear the labrum either the front or the back. But when you have a, when you have a slap injury, it usually relates to throwing. And what happens um, is the biceps tendon, which the long head attaches to the superior labrum, slowly peels the, bicep, the labrum off and can cause pain. Um, it is a, a sport type injury, but often, as in these photographs, it's actually often just degeneration. So if you scope my shoulder, you might find that I might have a, a crap, an average labrum here that um, could be considered a slap, in, slap injury. Often it's not the cause of pain, though. often it's an incidental finding. But if you did happen to have a slap injury, a true slap injury, say you're a cricketer and you're used to throwing the ball in from the boundary and every time you threw the ball you felt some pain and it's felt directly along the long-headed biceps, then an MRI might suggest this. And if you looked inside the shoulder, you might find this. In the past, we'd consider trying to repair the labrum back to the, the glenoid. But now, a more common operation, and you might see it in some of the operation notes coming through the patients who have had surgery, is a biceps tenodesis. And that's where you actually just release the long head of biceps off the labrum and reattach it outside the shoulder. And that's called a biceps tenodesis. And that's a relatively common operation done by a lot of shoulder surgeons. The reality is slap lesions are often overdiagnosed because often it's just, just degenerate. Um, a lot of the physios like to call a slap injury when the patient hasn't got better with um, time and physiotherapy and even surgery. But sometimes, as with any injury, it's not all surgery, not, every, not all physio gets a patient better anyway. There's other factors too that affect their outcomes. But a slap injury is a, it's been probably in the past been overdiagnosed, but now people have settled down to be aware that it's not that common. If we move on to other injuries, if you guys, if you see a play, player fall on the ground or they're thrown to the ground in a tackle, a very common injury you might see is an AC joint injury. And you can see it also if you ride your bicycle, come off a bicycle, an AC joint injury is very common as well. And there's various grades of it, the grade one to six. Here's what the normal AC joint looks like. Um, you can see the continuity and here's one where it's sitting up. And the grading goes, well we'll show the grading. 
a sprain, a, a mild sprain, a slightly greater sprain, where some of the ligaments, the, the important part of the AC joint is actually the cricoclavicular ligaments because it's the scapula is held onto the rest of the pectoral girdle by the clavicle through these ligaments. So the AC joint itself is not the issue. In fact, a lot of times as people age, they get arthritis in their AC joint. I've got a bit myself. And one of the operations I do for treating elective pain in the shoulder with AC joint pain is to take the end of the collarbone off. That's called an AC joint excision. So the AC joint's not the issue. It's actually the fact that coracoclavicular ligaments have been stretched or often ruptured. And therefore, what looks like the clavicle setting up is not the case. It's actually the rest of the shoulder falling down off the clavicle. And that's why it looks like it's actually superiorly subluxated. And if you get something like that, if it goes chronic, it can look something like that. And the treatment for it is if it's a bad enough dislocation, is to consider repairing it. And if you get on early, and what you can do is drill a hole through the clavicle and pass a sort of suture either around the coracoid or through the coracoid, what we call dog bone technique, to tie the, the actual coracoid to the clavicle to allow the ligaments to heal up. And that's called an AC joint reconstruction. Of course, not every injury that occurs around the clavicle is an AC joint injury. You can get clavicle fractures too. And if anyone is into cycling, they'll have seen some of the Tour de France people come off the bike and fracture a clavicle. Uh, most clavicle fractures heal, and you'll see, but if you get a very common usual one that's particularly short, we worry about the actual stress it puts on the scapular thoracic girdle. Because what happens is if the actual clavicle shortens, then the actual clavicle, the, the um, scapula will sit further forward around on the, clavicle, on the pectoral or on the rib cage and can lead to some pain. So we normally accept less than two centimetres of shortening. Um, there's also a risk of non-union too. So sometimes we, op we offer fixation of the clavicle with a uh, surgical plate. The actual most clavicles should heal. I've seen one today that might, is, uh, we, we, was taking a little bit of time, but most clavicles end up healing fine. But some of them do need surgery, particularly if they're short or particularly displaced. Now another one, one of my favourite injuries you might have you might have remembered me talking about in the past is radial head fractures. Now <clears throat> this is a classic one. I've actually seen a few of them in netball injuries where people fall forward and land on the outstretched arm. Now obviously you worry about scaphoids and distal radius, and we'll come to those. But one of the common ones is a, is a radial head fracture. Now the good thing about a radial head fracture is if it's not displaced, it will usually heal up fine. And the treatment is to get the thing moving. The reason it's one of my favourite questions is. I always say to the people who have been through my clinics, I say if you have two, two doctors and one misses the radial head fracture completely and the other person picks it up and puts the person in a plaster or a splint or a sling, which patient will do better? Well, the patient who gets, gets missed and they move the arm to told it's just a sprain will do better because if you immobilise a radial head fracture, it can lead to stiffness and that can be very hard to treat. So the treatment for an undisplaced radial head fracture is to, is to get it moving and the ones that are displaced, you've got to fix them and then get it moving. So, so this one here is quite depressed, so we fixed it with a couple of screws and you can see the radial head through the lateral com complex and uh, then we get it moving. Coming down the, down the arm, the distal biceps is another injury you might see. Um, now these, when I was going through your level, you never even heard about them. And when I was a junior registrar, you here see the occasional one. And now, now every second patient that comes through my clinic, is, well not every second one, but it seems like that, has got a ruptured distal biceps. <coughs> what it is, I think the actual quality and also the availability of ultrasounds has become more common. So people get ultrasounds to diagnose it, plus also people are aware of it. Now the long head of biceps rupture, if I, if I rupture my long head of biceps tomorrow, I, it doesn't usually cause any issues. <coughs> it can lead to a deformity. Does anyone know what the deformity is called when I get a long head of biceps rupture? Popeye sign. <clears throat> probably you all know that name. You probably don't know what Popeye is. Does anyone know who Popeye was? Yeah, yeah you'll do. There's an old cartoon from when I was a kid. So, um, so Popeye was big muscles. So not like me. And uh, so, um, so that's a Popeye sign. You can actually get a reverse Popeye sign when you get distal biceps rupture. Now with the long head of pro long yeah, that's the one. Um, so <laughs> an olive oil. And um, the, um, with a, with a long-headed biceps rupture, you've still got the short head attached to the coracoid, so it doesn't cause too many issues. It can cause some cramping and it's more of a cosmetic deformity, but sometimes we go and fix a long-headed biceps rupture. Ironically, if a long-headed biceps ruptures, we don't go and repair it back to the labrum, we do what we just showed before, a biceps tenodesis as part of the tensioning the, the, the actual biceps back up. 
Distally, the actual biceps has only got one head attaching into the, the proximal radius. And if that ruptures, there's been evidence that it should be repaired because it increases supinator strength. Now, I would say, and I say to all my patients, that in reality, I've had a handful of patients who haven't had surgery for one reason or another, and they really aren't that as bad as everyone thinks they are. So certainly, if I ruptured my distal biceps, I'm not sure I'd have it repaired, but the evidence is it probably is better off being repaired, so I do offer it to everyone. And the way you repair it is actually have to expose the actual proximal bite radius and either insert it either with a screw or with a button or various different techniques to get it tied down to the radius. But there are risks because there's a lot of nerves that go around that area. Around the, around the radius, proximal radius, there's the posterior interostis nerve and that can lead to loss of extension of the wrist or fingers. So that's a branch of the radial nerve. Um, and it also has a risk of re-rupture and stiffness too. And also the distal branch of the muscular cutaneous nerve, called the lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm, can also be bruised. You can go look at the nerve and it goes on strike. So it's actually, um, it can actually, often people have a bit of numbness there for a period of time anyway. So, so it's not without risk. But um, most distal biceps ruptures would, consider, would be repaired. And those sort of injuries would occur more commonly in, say, weightlifting. And, and there's a... Um, You'd expect that if, someone's, if someone my age is doing a lot of weightlifting, it might be more risky. If uh, one of you turned up with it, it could, you could just be unlucky in genetics, but also it's more common if you've been taking steroids as well. I'm not saying that happens in the weight, weightlifting community, but um, it is a possibility. Yeah. Now, of course, when, the most common things you'd see in one of our clinics would be wrist fractures, and these are, occur in orthopedics, sport injuries as well. And I've, this is actually some... Uh, x-rays of some broken wrists. The most common treatment for a broken wrist is, <coughs> if it's undisplaced, is let it heal. Like any fracture, if you reduce it and let it, let, and let it heal up on its own, it will heal up fine. The, <coughs> so we should have bought some water myself. Um, the exception of the rule is that radial head, we want to get it moving anyway, but most fractures you need to immobilise it for a period of time to let it heal. Here you can see, uh, if I get this thing working, the radius tilted back slightly and if we were in sit slightly shortened, and this is not the same patient, I don't think, but you can go on and plate them as well. Here's one though, where it doesn't look too bad. You think, oh, it's not too bad there. It looks a little bit funny. It looks pretty good on the AP view. But when you get a CT scan though, it shows it's actually subluxated. The whole carpus is subluxating off the distal articular surface and opening up through that gap. And so that's one, it's called a Barton's type fracture. And that one won't, if you, that one definitely needs surgery because you need to put that back into position because the actual the forces are such that this will always remain subluxated unless you put a metal plate in to subbuttress that back up. It doesn't look too bad, so if you're at all concerned, a CT scan is a good way of assessing it further. But this is one not to, not, not to miss. Okay, I thought I'd look, check my typing there for a sec. Mid-carpal dislocations. Here, I don't you can see the issue here. This is a capitate, and that should be sitting on the lunate. And we use the four C's to assess it. One, two, three, and then four. And this has actually popped out a joint. <coughs> I haven't got COVID, I don't think. Not that I know of. Um, so, just thirsty. I've been rushing around all day. Um, this is a... I remember seeing a patient like this once years ago when I was a registrar. So it would have been about 25 years ago. And um, it was, it was in, in one of the casualty departments. And... There's, they asked if there's anyone hanging around. So that guy, I don't think he's got much wrong with him. You could go and look at him. I went and looked at him. And his, his hand looked quite swollen. He'd fallen off a wall and landed on his outstretched wrist. And this can happen in sporting injuries too. And I thought, that's not quite right. When he's got an x-ray, and this is what, exactly what it looked like. And it's actually an emergency because it, obviously it puts stress on the um, median nerve. So it can lead to neurological symptoms. But also this can actually damage the, the ligaments between the bones. It can lead to, go on to develop early arthritis. Any questions so far? Moving on to the scaphoid fractures. Now, unbelievable as it sounds, I would see, in fact, we saw someone, I think, just, I wouldn't say when, but recently, but I'd see three to four scaphoid fractures a year that have been missed. And you'd think it'd be impossible. You'd think it'd be absolutely impossible because you guys are all taught from the, you know, you honestly, you come out of nappies, before you've even decided you're going to go to school, you're taught, that don't get an x-ray if you're worried about a scaphoid fracture. And yet, You'd be surprising how many, honestly, three or four I'd be seeing my clinic at miss. And the reason is it's because we all know it's got poor blood supply. So when it breaks, it doesn't bleed very much. It doesn't bruise. And because it's intra-articular and with poor um, neurological innovation as well, it's often not so sore. 
So I had a friend of mine actually, once I actually saw him, I was at the cricket with him and um, went to shake his hand. He said, oh, it's a bit sore there. I, I had a soccer ball. He went to st stop a soccer ball and that soccer ball hit, whacked his hand and pushed it back. Now explain to me the difference in biomechanics between that injury and then falling on an outstretched wrist. Okay, and it's pushing your wrist back. There's none. And so he's a bit sore on the radius. He said, he'd, he said a friend of his was a GP had thought it was going to be okay. I said, well, if you had x-rays and it was okay, he said, oh, no, I haven't had any x-rays. And I went, right, okay. So I said, maybe we should get some investigations done. And of course, he'd broken his scaphoid. So, so he's one of my friends. So it is actually, um, it's not that rare. I've also seen it with people using a, a, a drilling, drilling into masonry and it talks their wrist. Okay, there's a talking thing. So it's not just from an outstretched wrist, but in the sporting scenario, it's usually an outstretched, full and outstretched wrist. But it can occur from other things, like the soccer ball injury. That's a sporting injury. And here you can see the scaphoid, and it's actually, if you can see the fracture easily, it usually means it's displaced. And if it's displaced with poor blood supply, it's an indication for fixation. So the best way of assessing, if you're not sure about a scaphoid fracture, we all know, put it in a plaster and re-x-ray it two weeks later. Okay. You can get an MRI scan, although if you do it straight away, it may not show up. You can get an MRI, which also looks at other ligaments. But if you know there's a fracture, the best way of seeing which position it's in is a CT scan. And if you want to see if it's healing, a CT scan. So to help diagnose a fracture, an MRI is great. It will show bone edema around it. But to see how well it's healing or which position it's in, a CT scan. But of course, the classic is to put it in a splint. And you don't have to go, you know, we obviously want to put it in a plaster. But you don't have to. You've got a reliable patient. You put them in a removable splint like this and just tell them not to take it out. And if they do, just to wash their hands very rarely. But if they're not reliable, it will go for a full plaster. And sometimes they need to have a fixation with it, with a screw going through the scaphoid. Let me get this thing working. Um, and this one was done through a dorsal approach. Um, but you can go through the volar approach. Part of one of the other injuries you may not be aware of is a scapho lunar injury. And this again is the same sort of way. You fall on the outstretched wrist and you can disrupt the ligaments between the scapho and the lunate. Now, the scapho and lunate are the drive shaft of the wrist. They either they transmit force from the radius or into the metacarpals. Um, and so if you get a, either a fracture or a disruption of the ligaments between the two bones, and this will be an old one, that's why the gap's so big. Initially you won't see a big gap straight away unless it's an older one. And that, that gap between the two bones is known as a sign. Does anyone know that sign? Terry yeah, and that's, surely you don't know who Terry Thomas is, do you? Is yeah, God, he was, got, must be doing like history. Um, yeah, it is, he's well before my time. Is this guy, a British comedian, who had apparently a big gap in his teeth. So that's right, Terry Thomas sign. So very good. And that's the Terry Thomas sign there. But that's usually a sign of a chronic injury. If at all they're a bit sore in the middle of the wrist after a fall, then you've got to be a bit concerned about a scapho lunar injury. And what happens is if the fracture or the ligament disrupts, it disrupts the transmission of force and it can lead to abnormal positioning of the lunate on the uh, distal radius and on the capitate. And you can see it here. See this area here, the gap is a little bit weird. And that's because they've got, and you, if you actually look at this carefully, the, the lunate is tilted backwards. And that's a sign that there's a disruption of the ligament. And if you get disruption of the biomechanics between the two areas, it actually leads to, any altered biomechanics leads to secondary arthritis. Okay, and that can lead to arthritis in this area, the radiolunate region, sorry, uh, yeah, that's correct, uh, no, uh, radioscaphoid region in this area here. Um, and the lunate, radiolunate region stays, stays protected. And so well, that would lead to radioscaphoid arthritis in this area here. And the treatment for it is you have to take the scaphoid out and you can fuse these four bones together. But you don't want to miss the fracture in the first place or the ligament injury. Moving down, we're further getting down the finger injuries. Okay. The good thing, the funny thing about finger injuries is, and my learnt, this is what I learned from Glenelg, every time one of the players came off the field and, you know, you have this impression, they go in there really, really tough, and they come up and go, oh, my finger's a bit sore, Doc. And you look at it and go, I'm going to get an x-ray. Oh, I'll be fine, I'll be fine. You go, no, I'm going to get an x-ray. And every time, they'd have a break. Uh, honestly, I couldn't believe it. I said, sure, I said, sure, that sprain. They've played the rest of the game with it. And, and they've, they're still, they're actually, um, they've had a broken finger. So if you had all suspicion, x-ray it. When I was in the UK, there was a, a lot of the doctors that come to me and go, oh, we never x-ray hands because you're not going to do anything about it. It wouldn't be anything farther than truth. It's better off knowing about a diagnosis. You may decide not to treat it, but most of the times if there's a break, you might want to treat it. Like here, the base of the, base of the phalanx, middle phalanx. Or here, there's a condylar injury here. 
And that can lead to problems if you don't get onto it early. It's much easier. The finger injuries, they heal quite quickly or make it, the bone gets soft quite quickly. So you really got the first week or two to fix it. So, and the rehab's a lot harder. People think, oh, because it's a finger, it'll be a piece of cake. But it's actually a lot harder than people think. Probably it's made worse by the fact that their expectations would be easy. So, and if you're in an abnormal positioning or fracture, it doesn't have the right position, it can lead to abnormal rotation of the finger. So you've got to check for rotation. So an important part of assessing a, a finger is to see when they close the fist and make sure it doesn't overlap. Now, everyone's got a little bit of overlap on their hand, but it can be worse if it doesn't heal correctly. And PRP joint dislocation is a really common injury. And you'll see that they'll be going to mark a ball or catch, catch, a, catch a net ball or something, and the finger will dislocate, and they'll feel it pop out of joint. Now, you might have seen the trainer run on the ground and pull on the finger, and it pops it back into joint. And if you do it straight away, it doesn't hurt them at all. Um, if you wait for a few minutes until the muscle spasms up, then you can't do it and you have to put a ring block in. I had one of these patients, it might even be these x-rays actually for all I know, um, who came in about to see me a week later, about five, four or five days later anyway, um, with a dislocation. And I put a ring block in their hand and managed to reduce it back into position. So they can be reduced late if you, if you get onto if you try to reduce it properly. <coughs> but again, the x-ray will show that. Now, one of the other injuries is the soft tissue injuries around the finger. You've got your central slips. The central slip attaches to the base of the middle phalanx, where the lateral slips go around the distal phalanx. If you rupture the middle phalanx, the in, the, it leads to a deformity of the PIP joint, which is called boutonniere, because it buttonholes out through the two lateral slips. And then it leads to hyperextension of the distal phalanx in the attempt to try and straighten the middle phalanx. And that's called a boutonniere deformity. The treatment for these is hand therapy. You just want to get onto them early and get the position, hold the finger in extension and work on passive, on passive DIP flexion to retrain all the tendons around the hand. So, but this is a common injury as well. Because PRP joint injuries can be a real hassle. It's actually the, dry, the actual um, uh, main function of the hand. You can actually do a DIP fusion and I enjoy playing the guitar. I'm not very good at it, but I enjoy playing it. And you can do a DIP fusion. I'd probably be just as good as I am now, which is not hard. And um, so, and um, the um, because the DIP can function very well with it with the fusion. You just get it fused. So if you get arthritis in the DIP, fuse it. No problems at all. I mean, yeah, little problems, but very minimal. PIP, you fuse a PIP, they can function okay, but it certainly lose a lot of the finger motion. It can look deformed. And so you want to get onto it. And this here, this has been a chronic injury, and it's been subluxated and it's sitting on the top of it out of joint in this position here. So a PLP joint is the critical functioning of the hand. Now, just to remind you, metacarpal fractures again, they're called boxer fractures, sometimes the distal ones. They're not really boxer fractures because boxers don't, you know, punch walls. They use boxing gloves and punch bags, which are soft, or punch people. Um, so if you punch a wall and you break your metacarpal head, neck or head, then it's called a boxer fracture. Now, if you punch someone in the face and you get a tooth going into it, that's a compound injury to the soft, uh, compound injury into the joint. And so, if you're in casualty and you see someone come in with a broken metacarpal neck and a tooth mark in it, that patient needs surgery to have the tooth mark washed out because it will get a septic arthritis. Okay, so that's an indication for it. So routinely, so everyone, so it's one to remember. But metacarpal shaft fractures and neck, they can be treated, there's a bit of leeway in the hand, there's hyperextensibility. As long as there's no rotational deformity, they can be treated quite well. This one here is, even though it looks angled, a lot of it's actually the oblique, obliquity of the x-ray. When you get them a true latch, it's not quite as much. And the fifth finger, you can accept up to about, well, distally you can accept 40 degrees of flexion, deformity, and the shaft probably 30 to 35. Moving on to some of the lower limb injuries, hamstring injuries, very common injury. Um, there's, there won't be too many people who haven't heard of a hamstring injury, and it's an evulsion of the of the muscles off the back of the of the um, of the of buttock area. Obviously, it's all unless you pulled off a bit of bone with it, and high high performance uh, athletes may have the pull off a bit of issue of tuberosity with it. Then that needs to be repaired. But otherwise, most of them are just treated as a soft tissue muscle strain. I've got a friend of mine actually. We'll talk about it in a second. In quads, but um, you can rupture the. Um, the hamstrings and let it heal up. It, the problem is they scar up and they can continue to pull every time they return to training. So it takes a lot longer to settle down. Initial treatment is icing and compression bandages and then physio to take, try and stretch the other areas of the muscle to take the stress off it. The quad corky, which is where my friend comes into it. Quad corky is another one where you actually can bruise the quad and that leads to a hematoma in the muscle belly itself. Now we all know what muscle meat looks like. Um, 
And if you get a bruising in that area, it can actually really inflame all those little muscle fibres. And the moment they try to drive and power off, they can actually all go to, to kick, say, kick a footy. It can pull the muscles themselves. And so again, that involves anti-inflammatories and rice. There's a risk of myositis specificans. So sometimes an you know, appropriate patient might try using indomethacin to reduce that. And uh, icing helps reduce the bruising. And your three minutes on, three minutes off we use. Uh, but usually it just takes time to settle. Now my mate comes into it because he actually had a, a complete rupture of his quad me mechanism. He actually tore the muscle fibres and he's got like a, he tenses his quads. He's got a de decent defect in his quads. He still runs, runs you know, huge distances, rides his bike and does all his swimming. So you can function pretty well despite significant trauma to it. But an athlete would struggle. Now we get to, down to everyone's favourite, the cruciate injuries. Okay, so the problem with the cruciate is that first of all, it's almost like the sport's designed to tear it, particularly netball. The landing and not being able to take an extra step is designed almost to tear the cruciate. And uh, it, it isn't, and the people that tear it are more likely to have lax ligaments in the first place. Now if you tear the cruciate, because it's intra-articular, it doesn't heal itself, as opposed to the coracoclavicular ligaments, which actually are extra-articular and you put them back together, they'll scar up, or the medial collateral ligament of the knee where it can do the same. In ACL, you've got fluid running around it, plus also it's remaining unstable, so it's not actually in continuity, and so it won't heal itself. So the classic story is someone who lands awkwardly or goes twists on it or knee buckles on themselves, and then it feels unstable. And associated with it, there's also injuries to the meniscus and the medial collateral as well. And the way to treat it is actually to either, the old-fashioned way is to take part of the patella tendon and place that through the knee, or hamstring tendons, and some people even take quad tendons as well. Or you can use allografts. There was a vogue for using uh, artificial tendons for a while, but uh, that's, that's shown not to be a good idea. It's better to use natural tendons because this will incorporate into the soft tissue. So you actually put it into the knee, three tunnels we drill into the bone, and then the ligaments can actually revascularize. And so the little microscopic trauma that occurs down the track. So, for instance, if I grab one of the chairs and jump up and down on it, it'll be fine for a while, but eventually the metal fatigues and breaks. Same thing happens with the cruciate ligament. If you use an artificial ligament, it will slowly break and break. You need the bone to have the tendon to grow into the bone, or the actual the blood vessels to grow into the tendon to revascularize to become part of the actual knee itself, so that when you get little microscopic traumas, there's a natural healing response. And that's why aging, it by the way, is actually part of the problem. So you guys can go and uh, do whatever you want. If you have an injury, you recover pretty well because you've got a good healing response reparative mechanism, your collagen heals itself. Well, as, must, as you get older, that healing mechanism doesn't do as well. So as we get the microscopic trauma, it doesn't heal, and we get wrinkles, and we get older, and you know, everything deteriorates, unfortunately. Bad news. And, um, but in your, your, in the treatment, the, the, if you really want to become world famous and uh, be set for life, if you can develop a technique to restore collagen healing or how, reparative response, that will solve so many issues because there's the collagen de deformities and problems with collagen was why tendons rupture, it's why the muscle tear tears occur, it's why co the hyaline cartilage de deteriorates and degenerates and leads to arthritis. And also, more importantly for a lot of people, it causes wrinkles. Um, so, um, not so important for me, obviously. And um, the um, so the actual re the collagen is the cause of all the issues. That's why orthopedics is so good. Uh, I know you all want to be orthopaedic surgeons, of course. Um, well, wouldn't you want, not want to be? Um, but the good thing about orthopaedics and, and bone healing is that bone is one of the few, in fact, the only tissue really that actually heals back to be back to normal. All the other tissues, you know, neurons, uh, uh, cartilage, um, skin, all those sort of things, collagen just hits scars up, while bone regrows back to normal and be back to almost as perfect. So that's why orthopaedics is much better. <laughs> So ACL, if you rupture your cruciate, I'll go back to ACL, if you rupture your cruciate today, we, we would recommend most people that if having instability to have it repaired. Now not everyone has to have it repaired. In the past, people would get by and would still run marathons or play AFL footy, but the level, high level of sport they're playing and the, the surface they're running on was at the lower level. What's the reason we have it repaired? Well, the instability we always thought could lead to arthritis. But it's not so much the instability, the sliding mechanism that occurs in the ACL, it's the fact that the instability leads to the menisci to tear. And it's the menisci tearing, which actually helps improve the incongruity between the distal femur and the proximal tibia, 
then puts more joints, more force on the tibial surface or the femoral surface, then to secondary arthritis. So it's actually the meniscal tears that result from an ACL, ACL uh, instability that is what causes secondary arthritis. And it's the reason we recommend repair both, both for, first of all, to give them stability for sport, and secondly, to prevent long-term arthritis. And as I say, we take the tendon and we pass it through the bones and tension it so it reproduces the same as a normal cruciate ligament. Coming down to the end here, so we get down to the ankle injuries. How are we going? I'm probably, well, I'll do too bad for time for questions. Ankle injuries. Now, you all remember during, from last year, ankle injuries, the classic ones, I'd, I'd have my set questions. So you see an ankle, what's the first thing that comes to mind? You know, and Ottawa rules are the first thing. Because the Ottawa rules is a set of rules which, for me, whenever I see an ankle injury, they're always going to be positive on the Ottawa rules because that, that's the reason they're coming to me in the first place, is that we're concerned about an ankle fracture. But if you see your, your brother falls over and sprains his ankle, the Ottawa rules will help you decide whether they're bad enough to go off to get an x-ray or whether it's a sprain. And the same thing in a casualty. Ankle sprains are probably the most common sporting injuries of the lot. I mean, there wouldn't be too many of you that haven't had an ankle sprain or almost had an ankle sprain um, in the audience. And if you, you know, I, I do it all the time because I've got lax ligaments in the first place. But the, again, it's the same scenario. The laxity in your ligaments helps put, um, cause instability, which leads to ankle sprains. So when you roll your ankle, there's a whole heap of different injuries that can occur. The classic is the injury of the lateral ligament complex, the anterior talar fibula, the calcaneal fibula, the posterior talar fibula. And they, they disrupt in that order. And the more it disrupts the ligaments, if it's only partially disrupted, the more you sprain it, it causes pain. You disrupt the ligaments so badly, you might roll your ankle all the time but not get any pain because there's nothing to pull upon. The ligaments are actually already pulled apart. Um, an ankle sprain, though, for most people, are treated with this time, icing, and getting the, the ankle moving. But the other injuries that can occur are fractures at the lateral malleolus um, or at the base of the fifth metatarsal, or you can even do fractures of the tail of the neck. So, in a standard ankle sprain, you treat it with, with rehabilitation. If it's really bad, sometimes they can repair, but usually most repairs are done as a chronic instability issue where they've continually sprained their ankle all the time. But if you get a fracture, such in this scenario, then you might need surgery. And of course, the rules you would have learned about from last year is the Weber classification, where an a Weber A is basically an ankle ligament, medial ligament, sorry, a lateral ligament sprain of the lateral ligaments pulled off a bit of bone. Weber B is where it actually fractures the distal mal malleolus, but the syndesmosis is fine. Or C is when the ligament between the two bones is pulled apart. And that's when you have to put a plate and a screw to help support it to allow the syndesmosis ligaments to heal up better. Again, an ankle fracture, if you're left alone, see how this whole talus has moved slightly laterally because the medial malleolus has gone with it. They'll put stress on the joint, and when you get asymmetrical, asymmetrical positioning of the bones or the joints, bones in the joint, or biomechanical um, loss of positioning, it can lead to secondary arthritis once again. So I think that's a, it's a lot to go through, and there's, there's a few more, well, not a few more, there's a lot more injuries we can talk about. But for an hour talk, I think there's a lot to go through in that area. So I thought I'd, I'd throw the floor open to, uh, uh, for questions as a general outline of different sporting injuries that can occur. And also, you might, um, might be th your thoughts you've had in mind that you know, I didn't cover today. So if you want to ask me about those as well, we can address them. So any questions? How common are olecranon fractures? Ah, we didn't do that one. Olecranon fracture is actually, the thing is, olecranon fracture is relatively common, but it's more commonly in the older person because what it is it's an evolution of the triceps with a bit of bone. So it's basically a Weber A fracture, like the lateral malleolus where it pulls off with the bone, but it occurs at the triceps, and the triceps pulls off the olecranon. Mm -hmm. So most olecranon fractures are like that, unless you get really bad ones, and they're known as terrible triads, which involve radial heads and disruption of lateral and collateral ligaments and even the coronoid. And they're still terrible triads because they're really hard to treat and they can lead to problems later on. But the standard olecranon fracture is fairly common, but usually in the older person, and that can be treated either with tension band wiring. You've got to put the bit of bone back with the, with the triceps and put some wires through to tie it down, or you can put a metal plate on it as well. So, yeah, you wouldn't see too many. I, I don't think I've seen one in a, in, certainly nothing, no one in your age group, um, unless you've, have you had one yourself? Or? I don't know. My partner kept saying that he felt like a bony part on his elbow that like, kept moving, but he plays volleyball, so that's why like, he would probably fall on it. But it, I was like, querying if it was an electron fracture because 
She doesn't seem to have anything wrong with his triceps either, but it's just a small avulsion fracture if it is one. Well, you can get you can get avulsion of the triceps off the off the leg or anyway to cause pain there, and that's triceps tendinopathy. And you can get a little spur that comes off with it that develops. Yeah. Well, anytime you get whenever you get tendons pulling on bone, it can form a bit of bone along that tendon. Yeah. And then that, that little bit of bone spur can break off. And that you do see that in, tri in the olecranon area. Mm. But also, in all parts of the body, uh, the most classic one is the hip. But all parts of the body has a risk of what are called osteochondritides. And we didn't ca don't make a big deal of that in the fourth year because it's probably more of a paediatric condition. It's probably a higher level. But it's worth knowing about where both the capitellum in the elbow, the femoral head, it's called Perthes disease, in the second metatarsal head, called Freiberg's disease, or in the knee, the, I think it's a medial femoral condyle, are the four main ma main areas where bits of the bone can just die off and then it floats off as a loose fragment. So often you'll see a younger, you can get younger people presenting with a locked knee from a bit of this bone just dying off and then floating around in the knee joint as a loose body. And you can get in the, it's not that common in the elbow. To be honest, I, haven't, I don't think I've really seen it actually, but uh, in all these years, but you can, but also you can get a part of trauma, you can get a bit of articular surface being knocked off as well, which can look like it. But all those things, the classic one is the young, young kid with fiber, with um, Perthes disease, where the femoral head dies off and then it collapses because it's a weight bearing joint, it collapses and leads to secondary arthritis later on in life. So that's called Perthes disease. And everyone, well, you might have heard about that. But you can get it in the capitellum as well. But they're probably not really a sporting injury. There's things that occur incidentally in people who play sport. But you can get traumatic injuries. When you roll your ankle, you can knock off a tailor, the part of the tailor dome as an osteochondritis, as an osteochondral fragment. And that looks very similar to those things too. It's osteochondritis as well. Other questions? It's a Friday afternoon, so, so no wonder. Um, but there's a lot to cover there, and it's a good th thoughts. But to be honest, all these things I put in here are fairly, fairly common. Probably the only one I only thought about as I was finishing off the talk was as a syndesmosis injury. You can get, and that's quite common. It's becoming more common now. It's a bit like the distal biceps ruptures. I think people are more aware of it, so, and, the, and the availability of MRIs for uh, investigating. And that's where someone's had a, a forced dorsiflexion on their ankle. And it's because of the shape of the tail, it pushes the... Uh, the two bones, the, right, the distal tibia and fibula apart and stretches the syndesmosis. And that can be a cause of chronic ankle pain, um, which is, can be hard to diagnose because the syndesmosis isn't that vascular, so it doesn't bleed that easily. But it can be picked up on MRI scans. So, and usually if you pick it up early, you want to treat them in a, in a, spint, in a splint sorry, to protect it, to stop the actual recurrent stretching of that ligament. So you might have heard of some of the footy players la last few years having those as well. So it's one of the ones that I thought of as I was finishing off the talk tonight. So, well, look, thank you very much for your time and uh, wish you all the best in the fifth year and look forward to seeing you guys down the track uh, as interns and coming through all, all wanting to do orthopedics, of course. So, <laughs> right, so thank you.